We light this candle as a symbol of the purity of heart only God can bring. For he shall purify his people like gold and silver until they come, until they shine forth his righteousness. Come, Come, Lord Lord Jesus, Jesus, come. come. If you have a Bible with you, go ahead and and grab it and turn to Luke chapter 2. Luke chapter 2, we're going to read verses 1 to 7 this morning. Luke chapter 2, verses 1 to 7. I'm reading from the King James Version this morning because I think the Christmas story sounds better in the King James. Luke chapter 2, verses 1 to 7. And it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. And this taxing was first made when Cyrenius was governor of Syria. And all went to be taxed, every one into his own city. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, out of the city of Nazareth, 
into Judea, under the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be taxed with Mary, his espoused wife, being great with child. And so it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. The words of God. So we're continuing, continuing on in our Advent series, and this year uh, we are exegeting some Christmas carols. We are looking at the Christmas story as told by hymn writers. Christmas carols contain some of the greatest melodies, some of the greatest words in the hymnody of the church. And so this year we are exegeting a few of those. Last week we looked at familiar Advent hymn, Come Thou Long Expected Jesus. And this week we are studying just a work of art this song is. This week we're studying the hymn, O Little Town of Bethlehem. And it was Christmas Eve, 1865, that Reverend Phillips Brooks took a journey by horse from Jerusalem down to Bethlehem. And in, a, in the story recalling this hymn, Brooks recalls that even on the night that he took his trip, Bethlehem seemed still and quiet. The ride took him about two hours. He also journeyed around the town to the hillside where it said that the shepherds were that night. And after arriving in Bethlehem, Brooks and his crew participated in a Christmas Eve service at the Church of the Holy Nativity, which is located on what's popularly thought of to be the place of Jesus' birth. And it's said that the service started at 10 o'clock p.m. and lasted until 3 in the morning. Do the math. It's a long service. So that was 1865, but it wasn't until 1868 no doubt, reflecting on his time in the Holy Land, and specifically reflecting on his experience in Bethlehem. It was in 1868 that Brooks took pen to paper and penned the words of these hymns. It was first written for a Sunday school choir. It was written as a children's song. It was written for the Sunday school choir at the church where Brooks pastored, and it was first performed, this hymn was performed on Christmas Eve, 1868, by the Children's Choir, the Church of the Holy Trinity in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. And the success and the popularity of this hymn were instantaneous. The hymn itself... The hymn itself is quite unusual. It's unlike any other Christmas carol. Unlike other Christmas carols, it doesn't tell the Christmas story. The first Noel tells the Christmas story. We Three Kings tells a Magi story. Oh, little town of Bethlehem doesn't. It doesn't recall the Christmas story. Unlike other hymns, unlike other carols, it really doesn't even express any praise to God. And until the last verse, it offers no prayers either. The hymn, the carol, it seems to be a meditation on Bethlehem itself. But the carol... through seemingly simple words and meditation, it really is a reflection of the Incarnation. It really is a meditation on the Incarnation. It's a meditation on the night that 
God came to earth and dwelt among us. Upon studying this hymn, the only word I can use to describe it, it's exquisite. The actual writing of the words, they're exquisite. The melody is beautiful. It's beautiful in its simplicity, but it is profound. It's profound in its theological insights. So let's look at the words of this hymn. Inspired by his trip and his experience in Bethlehem. Hear the words. The words will show up on your screen. Verse 1 says this, O little town of Bethlehem, how still we see thee lie. Above thy deep and dreamless sleep the silent stars go by. Yet in thy dark streets shineth the everlasting light. The hopes and fears of all the years are met in thee tonight. Some of the themes introduced in this verse. Deep, dreamless sleep. The theme of the quietness of Jesus' arrival. The theme of missing the arrival of the anticipated Messiah. Verse 2 says this, Brooks took a trip around the hillside where the shepherds were and wrote this, For Christ is born of Mary and gathered all above, while mortal sleep the angels keep their watch of wandering love. O morning stars together proclaim the holy birth and praises sing to God the King And peace to men on earth, while mortals sleep. Again, the theme of missing, missing the whole thing. The angels keep their watch of wandering love. O morning stars together, the angels, the morning stars. O morning stars together, proclaim the holy birth. The angels singing, we're going to study that next week. The angels singing to the shepherds, proclaim the holy birth and praise a sing to God the King, peace to men on earth, a familiar refrain from the angels. Verse 3 stresses the inauspicious beginnings of Jesus' life. How silently, how silently the wondrous gift is given. So God imparts to human hearts the blessings of his heaven. No ear may hear his coming, but in this world of sin, where meek souls will receive him still, the dear Christ enters in. How silently, how silently. So silently that most people missed it, given but a handful of shepherds. No ear may hear his coming again. Missing the incarnation. God promised to send a Messiah. Isaiah prophesied that a virgin will conceive a son and give birth to him. And when that prophecy was fulfilled, it happened silently. But even though it happened silently, it still fulfilled A prophecy, and it still fulfilled a promise that God made to his people. God imparts, even though it happened silently, God imparts to human hearts the blessings of his heaven. No ear may hear his coming. But in this world of sin, where meek souls will receive him still, the dear Christ enters in, foreshadowing what the birth of God's Messiah would mean for humanity. What a beautiful meditation. What a beautiful meditation on Bethlehem, on this little town. But we have to ask ourselves the question, why Bethlehem? Why Bethlehem? Why not Jerusalem? Why not the big town? 
Why did God send his son, born of a virgin, born in the back country, hick town of Bethlehem? Why did God's salvation plan begin in this little town, so sleepy? Hardly anybody noticed it happened. The answer is because Bethlehem, though small in size, punches above its weight class. It is a significant little town. Let's trace some of the history of this small town. The story of Boaz and Ruth happened in Bethlehem. Boaz, in in the story, is called a kinsman redeemer or a family redeemer, and he restored, he redeemed Naomi and Ruth to a place of honor in their society. The story of Boaz and Ruth as a, a kinsman redeemer is a foreshadowing of a greater redeemer that will one day come from this town of Bethlehem. And Ruth and Boaz, they put down roots in Bethlehem. And they had a son named Obed. And Obed had a son named Jesse. And Jesse had a son named David. And when King Saul turned his back on God, when Israel was in desperate need of a new and godly king, God sent Samuel to Bethlehem to find a new king, David. And it was there in Bethlehem that David was anointed by Samuel to be the next king of Israel. And a couple hundred years after David, God, through the prophet Micah, spoke these words, and he said, But you, O Bethlehem, Bethlehem Ephrathah, though you are little among the clans of Judah, yet out of you shall come forth a ruler of Israel, whose going forth have been from old, from everlasting. Now what we have to understand is the the context of this prophecy. The nation of Israel was in shambles. The kingdom was divided, the kings were wicked, and their enemies were surrounding them. And Micah says to the people that in light of All that is happening around you, in spite of all of the wickedness of the king, in spite of the seemingly hopeless situation of your surroundings, God will promise, God promises to send a ruler. A ruler who will come from the town of Bethlehem, in the country of Ephrathah. And later in the prophecy, it says that this ruler will not be a source of war, but a source of peace. Micah says that God's Messiah, God's promised deliverer, his redeemer, will come from the little town of Bethlehem. So that's a lot of prophecies about God's Messiah. And if we combine the, the prophecies of, of the prophecy of Bethlehem with the ones that we looked at last week, we get quite the list that this God's Messiah has to be born of the royal line, born of David's lineage, born of the tribe of Judah, has to be born in the town of Bethlehem. That's a lot of prophecies for one person to fulfill. But as the hymn says, the hopes and fears of all the years are met in thee tonight. That in the coming of Jesus, the prophecies are fulfilled. But how is God going to work this out? 
After Micah, the prophet, things actually got worse. Things actually got worse for Israel and for Judah. The nations were captured and they were sent away to exile. The kingly line of David wasn't so kingly anymore. It was all but dissolved. There was no king. There was no king in Israel. They were exiled to Babylon. They were sent back for a brief time, but then once again they were occupied by various nations, Antiochus, Epiphanes, and ultimately the land of Israel, like most of the known world, came under the occupation of the Romans. And that's where Israel was when we begin the Christmas story in Luke. But as we read the beginning of Luke's gospel, as we read Luke 1 and 2, as we read Matthew chapter 1, we begin to see these prophecies fulfilled. We begin to see the criteria met. In Luke chapter 1, we're told that the Holy Spirit came upon Mary and she conceived in her womb a son even though she was a virgin. Mary was betrothed to a man named Joseph and we're told in Luke chapter 2 that Joseph was a descendant of David. question we have to ask ourselves is, what about Bethlehem? What about the little town of Bethlehem? How is Micah's prophecy going to be fulfilled? How is all of this going to take place in Bethlehem? We're told in the beginning of Luke chapter 2 that Mary and Joseph lived in Nazareth. Nazareth was north of of Jerusalem, by the Sea of Galilee. Bethlehem is south of Jerusalem. How was it ever going to be that people that lived in Nazareth were going to go to Bethlehem? People didn't travel in those days. How is it that Micah's prophecy was going to be fulfilled? How is it that the prophecy about Bethlehem was going to be fulfilled when God's promised Messiah was conceived in a girl who lived in Nazareth. God's solution was this. He was going to use a Roman census to do it. Luke chapter 2 verse 1 tells us that when Mary was pregnant and about to give birth. Caesar Augustus, the most powerful man in the world at that time, Caesar Augustus decreed a census. Now, the Roman government, they often decreed censuses. Censuses? Sure, why not? They did it so that they could get better at taxing people. A census wasn't a a new or an obscure idea. They did it often, but this census was different. Augustus, at this time, he wanted to show off his power. He wanted to show how strong he was. He wanted to inconvenience people as much as possible. He wanted to flex his political muscle a little bit. And so for this census, it was different than other censuses in the past. So he decreed that every single person had to go to their family hometown. Had to go back to that place where their family originated from, where their family originally lived. So for me, it would be going back to Brantford. A census. A census where everybody had to go back to their hometown to register. So here, Mary and Joseph, two teenagers, swept up in a tide of moving people, two people among millions who were making their way back to their hometown. 
And since Joseph, since Joseph was a descendant of King David, he and Mary had to return to Bethlehem, the place where Boaz redeemed Ruth, the place where David was anointed king, the place that Micah prophesied about. How did God get his Messiah to Bethlehem to be born there? He used Caesar to do it. Augustus thought that he was moving his political pawns around. He was putting on a great display of his power. But in reality, Caesar Augustus was a pawn in God's plan. God was arranging things just the way they needed to be. Paul in Galatians chapter 4 says this, that in the fullness of time, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who are under the law. The fullness of time, when the time was just right, when the precise moment arrived, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law. How precise was the timing? Augustus was Caesar. How precise was the timing? Augustus called an inconvenient census to send everyone back to their hometown. How precise was the timing? Cyrenius was governor of Syria. A virgin named Mary was betrothed to a man named Joseph. Joseph was a descendant of David who had to go back to Bethlehem in order to fulfill the prophecy that was made by Micah. Why? Because of Caesar's decree? Absolutely not. Because God was arranging things so that at the precise time, his son could be born to fulfill the prophecies. So who sent Mary and Joseph back to Bethlehem? No, it wasn't Caesar. It wasn't Caesar. Mary and Joseph were guided back to Bethlehem by God himself. So that through them, through the census, an ancient prophecy could be fulfilled. Yet, in thy dark street shineth the everlasting light. And what the carol so beautifully articulates, what Luke underscores in Luke chapter 2, is that the arrival of God's Messiah happened so quietly. It happened so under the radar. And if you read Luke chapter 2, verses 1 to 7, and you actually read it, not what we think it says, but what it actually says, not what society has built it up to be or church history has built it up to be. If you read what the actual words say, the story is so simple. There's not a lot of details. It happened under the radar. It happened under the radar, happened so quietly that almost everybody missed it. And when I study the hymn, when I study this beautifully crafted carol, I see Bethlehem as a warning. It warns us that it's possible to miss God's work. The child of promise was right there in their town, and no one noticed. With the exception of a few shepherds, everyone just went on their merry way. They were completely oblivious to what was happening right under their noses. So what will we miss? If we aren't in tune with what God is doing, if we aren't paying attention to the way God is moving and the way God is working in our lives, what will we miss? The town of Bethlehem, the Israelites in general, they were waiting for God's Messiah to come. 
In Micah chapter 5, verse 2, it's obscure to us. We read it once a year. We don't spend a lot of time. Actually, we do spend some time in the Minor Prophets. Maybe we should look at Micah next year. Maybe. We'll see. But when the wise men came to Herod, the men around Herod were able to quote Micah 5, chapter 2, because they knew that it was out of Bethlehem that a ruler would come. They knew he was coming, and he came. Prophecy was fulfilled. And they missed it. What will we miss? What will we miss? There's a warning in Bethlehem. There's a warning in this hymn. We have to be paying attention to what God is doing. There's a modern Christmas song, and one of the lines in it says this, will Jesus come again and leave you slumbering where you lay? Bethlehem warns us. Pay attention to what is going on. Pay attention to what God is doing. You never know when or how God is going to work. And in closing this morning, I want us to look at the final verse of this great carol. In most hymnals, it's verse 4, but it's actually verse 5. There's a, a, a fourth verse verse in there. We're not going to read it. Look it up. It's on Google. Well, the previous three verses were a meditation on Bethlehem. The fourth verse is entirely different. The fourth verse of this carol is a prayer. Like the second verse of Come Thou Long Expected Jesus, this is a Christmas prayer. Listen to these words. O holy child of Bethlehem, descend to us, we pray. Cast out our sin and enter in. Be born in us today. We hear the Christmas angels, the great glad tidings tell. O come to us, abide with us, our Lord, Emmanuel. This Christmas prayer highlights the fact that this child born in Bethlehem was no ordinary child. The prayer highlights the salvation that this child brought with him. It highlights the enduring nature of Jesus' work. Hear the words again, O holy child of Bethlehem, descend to us, we pray. Cast out our sin and enter in. Be born in us today. These are words of confession. You can't say these words. You can't say, sing these words and not be moved by them. Come into my life and be my Savior. Live and move and work. The last two lines, great words. Words of worship. Oh, come to us. Abide with us, our Lord, Emmanuel. What a beautiful prayer. What a beautiful prayer for this Christmas season. Next week, next week we are going to study the angel's proclamation to the shepherds as told by the hymn, Hark the Herald Angels Sing. Let's pray. God, again, I thank you for this beautiful hymn. A meditation on the town of our Savior's birth and a warning to us all to pay attention to what is going on. Most of Bethlehem missed it. God, I pray that we will heed the warning of this town. That we will pay attention to the way that you are moving and working. 
God, I pray that we will accept this child that was born, who didn't stay a child, but grew to be a man and died on a cross and rose again, the Savior of the world. And as we reflect on what Jesus has done for us, both being born, dying, and rising again, we pray the words of this hymn. We say, O holy child of Bethlehem, descend to us, we pray. Cast out our sin and enter in. Be born in us today. We hear the Christmas angels, the great glad tidings tell. Come to us, abide with us, our Lord, Emmanuel. I love coming around the Lord's table, specifically during Advent. I love this time because we get a combination of Easter and Christmas. We get this combination of the birth of Jesus and celebrating and preparing ourselves to worship Christ, the newborn King, but then we also have the opportunity to look past Bethlehem and, and the manger and, and all of that, and we look forward to, to Easter. Good Friday, the death and the resurrection of Jesus, and we look to Easter Sunday. And here in this time, we celebrate Christ the newborn King. We celebrate Christ the risen King. It's beautiful. The symbolism, the imagery of it is just mind-blowing. And as we do, as our tradition here at Dutton and Iona Station Baptist Church, this time around the Lord's table is a community-building exercise. And even though we're uh, apart and uh, you are watching this uh, in the comfort of your own home, this is still a community-building exercise, and we can still take this time to prof profess our common faith, to pray the prayer that Jesus had taught us to pray. And so the words will show up on your screen. Let's say together the words of the Apostles' Creed, and let's pray together the Lord's Prayer. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. And from there, he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let's pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. God, we thank you for this time around your table. Especially in this season of Advent, as we look forward to the birth of Jesus, we look past his birth to his death and his resurrection. Actually, we look to the night of the Last Supper, the night he was betrayed. As he instituted this meal as an act of remembrance. And we thank you for this bread that we have that represents your broken body on our behalf, and we thank you for the cup. The cup represents your shed blood for the remission of our sins. 
Thank you for this time around your table. We pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it. He said, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And we're told that in the same way after supper, Jesus took the cup. He said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink of it in remembrance of me. And the Apostle Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 11, that as often as we eat of the bread and we drink of the cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. Amen.